Uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. I see from the chat that we have people from all around the world, which is very exciting. Thank you for joining us. And welcome to our second session in our long COVID webinar series. This is actually part of our You Plus Me Registry one year anniversary. For those of you who follow us on social media uh, or are part of our email listserv, you've probably received communication from us already. Um, but for the month of September, we're celebrating the one year anniversary of the registry. Um, just to kind of give you a sense of, of what we've done so far. So we, in our first, in the first part of our webinar series, we were joined by doctors Natalie Lambert and Nazreen Alwan. And that episode is available to catch up if you haven't, if you weren't able to join us live for that event. But today we're excited to welcome Dr. Bupesh Prusti, who is an award-winning researcher and the Principal Investigator at the Institute for Virology and Immunobiology at University of Würzburg in Germany. Uh, we will be sharing details about our third session in this series towards the end of today's discussion. So before we, I hand it over to Dr. Prusty, I am going to give you an overview of the registry, um, in particular, the long COVID cohort and give you guys a sneak peek of some data that we've generated for, as a result of a vaccination survey that we recently did with that population. So our, this is our overall enrollment. So almost at 5,000, if you can believe that. So, you know, we started, we launched a year ago. Uh, we went live with the long COVID cohort um, towards the end of that year. So we went live in June and the COVID cohort opened towards the end of the year in December. And you can see from our enrollment um, that we're, we're really doing amazing. We're really, you know, the community really responded to it and we're really thrilled by the engagement that we've been getting. So we're up almost 3000 in the MECFS cohort, 500 in the controls. We have about 820 or so in the long COVID cohort. And then um, 661 people with MECFS who are enrolling as part of our relationship with uh, our partners in Australia. So Emerge in Australia is using the UME registry to enroll a cohort in that part of the world. So thrilled as to where we've got to, we've got almost 2 million data points uh, at this point. And so, um, really one of our goals over the coming months is to start to dig into that data and really try and understand what what we've learned so far so more to come and um, if you haven't signed up for the registry we'd encourage you to do so you can find out more information at uh, you and me registry.com and um, love you to encourage people in your life friends family members to sign up as controls would really like to see that number tick up so I'm now going to talk a little bit about um, some of the long COVID cohorts specifically. So this looks at, you can see from the heat map, this shows enrollment around the world for people with long COVID. So um, we've got a majority of people in the United States, um, some in Canada. We also have significant representation in the UK um, and some in the Netherlands, Ireland, Germany. So um, we were pleased with the spectrum. We'd love to see it tick up further. And I saw, see that so from some of the, the chat that people are in different parts of the world. So uh, please, if you haven't signed up, please do so, um, so that we can see the geographic representation increase around the, increase around the world. So next slide, please. So this, again, this is just the long COVID cohort. So you see the age distribution here. Um, it's kind of a normal distribution peaking in the 35 to 54 age range, but a significant number in the 25 to 34. And I'm sure that's not a surprise to anyone who's been watching the news and um, seeing how long COVID is affecting uh, younger people. Um, predominantly female, again, I don't think that that's a great surprise. Although just to caveat those statistics, I do believe that there's probably some underrepresentation, um, underreporting um, of uh, among men um, related to long COVID in a similar way that we've seen with MECFS over you know several years. 
the race ethnicity uh, is predominantly white and, and a priority for us in the coming months is to try and increase that diversity so that the, uh, the data that's in our registry is more representative of the population. And then on the right, you see the functional impairment represented here. So, you know, mild is about 23%, moderate 61.4%, um, and then severe 14.5%. So, you know, most people are, uh, I would say, are having a moderate impact on their functional impairment, but certainly a good chunk of people are severely impacted. And next slide, please, Jesse. I think I. This slide I find so compelling, so these data. So on the left, you see the self-report activity levels before someone got the COVID infection. So at the top bar, you see highly active, moderately active, slightly active, mostly sedentary, sedentary. And you can see in the green, you know, most people before they got COVID were, were in the highly or moderately active. And then if you turn your eyes over to the right hand side, you can just see it's completely flipped. So just very, uh, very profound impact on how, how, um, pe how active people are and how impaired they are in being able to, to do um, the stuff that they were able to do previously. So again, no surprise for, for those of you on the call who have NECFS and have been you know, struggling with these same, the same activity levels for, for years or decades, but very, compelling um, switch that's happened as a result of uh, long COVID. So I mentioned earlier that we did put a vaccination survey out in among our community. So this was to understand, you know, the, the impact of the COVID vaccine on symptoms. And we had heard and read anecdotal reports from some people saying, the vaccine made them feel better, the vaccine re reversed their long COVID symptoms. Um, and so we really wanted to better understand that. So we put this the survey out to date, 613 people have completed it. And you see the breakdown by cohort there. So majority MECFS uh, controls and then COVID. And if you go to the next slide, please, Jesse, um, you can see from these data uh, that the, the impact of the vaccine on their health. So people answered this question, how is your health now compared to before you received the vaccine? And you see on MECFS on the left, a majority of people, the vaccine, the COVID vaccine didn't impact their health at all um, with, you know, some slightly better, um, but for the most part, there was no impact. And then if you see on the circle on the right, you can see, on the gray, uh, the mint green and the dark green, it's looking like for the people with long COVID, the vaccine is having some kind of impact on, on their symptoms. So very early data, um, wanted to give you guys a sneak peek, um, but our goal now is to really dig into this and understand it, understand it more, look at whether any of this is statistically significant, um, and really deepen our understanding of how the vaccine is impacting both ME-CFS and long COVID. So that's all I had for in terms of a sneak peek for the registry. I would just again like to reiterate, I think Jesse put it in the chat. Please check out our website, youandmeregistry.com and would encourage you to sign up and to get friends and family to do the same. So um, happy to take questions at the end of the session. Um, but for now, I am gonna turn it over to Dr. Prusty. So just to give an introduction. So Dr. Bupesh Prusty is an award-winning researcher for the Institute of Virology and Immunology at University of Würzburg. He studies interactions between persistent intracellular bacterial and viral infections and was a postdoc researcher in the laboratory of Nobel laureate professor Harold Zerhausen. Apologies if I've messed up that pronunciation, Bupesh. Um, <laughs> at the German Cancer Research Center studying human endogenous retroviruses. Uh, Bupesh received one of our Ramsey Awards, which is our grant program to fund MECFS research, uh, encourage people to come into this field and stay engaged in MECFS research. So we're, we're thrilled that that um, has 
come true with Bupesh, who continues to study MECFS. Um, he is with us today, as you just heard from, from his interjection, um, but he did pre-record his presentation uh, due to concerns about uh, internet bandwidth and um, being able to uh, have an effective internet connection from his home. So uh, Dr. Prusty is in Germany and so uh, much later in the evening there and is not in the office today, but um, was joining us from his home. So we will play the video. Um, and then Dr. Prusty is going to be available uh, at the end of the webinar to answer any questions. And I'm also happy to take any questions uh, um, that you might have about the registry and some of the data I presented. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Prusty. And with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Jesse, who's going to press play on the video. So good morning, good afternoon and good evening to um, all of you around the world. Today, I'm Tom and Jerry. Don't be surprised. This is how pathogens work inside our body, within our cells. We often end up with having multiple pathogens within our cells, like Tom and Jerry living within the same house. They either attack each other and or live harmoniously with each other even if it is temporary under both conditions our cells are damaged sometimes intentionally sometimes unintentionally i think this is a very nice way to picturize our cellular niche thanks to um one of our junior colleagues in the lab, um, Money, who actually suggested this to me. I'm Bhupesh and today I have just 20 minutes to share our working model with you on a very important topic of this century probably and that is long COVID. To start with, I have um, some disclaimers. Most of these ideas that we are going to discuss here today are based on preliminary data generated with very small sample sizes, hence results should be considered carefully. We are here today to discuss our ideas on long COVID and how research is shaping along these lines. Today's presentation is carefully designed for general non-scientific audience, not having much of in-depth knowledge in the field. Hence, those who have expertise on this field might find certain topics too superficial. Today we are going to discuss four major points. The term long COVID, our ideas on development of long COVID, and the comparison between long COVID and MECFS. And where do we stand now? Today we are not just talking about fatigue or post-viral fatigue. We are going to talk about post-COVID or long COVID, which in my opinion is much more than just fatigue. But I do not think that post-COVID and long COVID are the same. For me, post-COVID is more like the effects of a severe COVID infection, which might be the case with patients with initial severe SARS-CoV-2 infection those who were hospitalized. But long COVID represents mostly the consequences of COVID-19 infection in patients having mostly an asymptomatic or very mild first infection. I'm not suggesting any names here. That is not my expertise. But maybe experts in the field should think about it. So what can cause long COVID? There are potentially three possibilities. The first one is severe SARS-CoV-2 infection and subsequent effects, including the widely discussed cytokine changes. This possibility is very widely discussed nowadays, but we have to consider the fact that majority of the patients infected with SARS-CoV-2 do not develop long COVID. So this possibility is probably not the ideal one. 
There are two other possibilities which fits to our working model. The second possibility is that SARS-CoV-2 persistence in localized tissues and afterwards reactivation. The third possibility is that SARS-CoV-2 as an initial trigger which afterwards reactivate persistent or latent viruses like herpes viruses, endogenous retroviruses, etc. So here is our working model. This is not a hypothesis as it is based on our own ongoing work and is constantly evolving. I believe that there are two different forms of long COVID or post COVID. The first one probably starts with a very strong dose of virus infection. For example, in those who work in the healthcare system, system and um, frequently get exposed to infected patients. Here the virus dose is high and probably it rapidly takes over the host cell. These patients will mostly be hospitalized because of severe clinical conditions. There will be severe cytokine response and subsequent tissue and organ damage. There will be longer recovery time in these patients with various clinical conditions which are basically a result of localized tissue damage from the severe COVID-19 infection. The other type of patients will have very low infectious dose. Their host innate immunity probably is very strong which keeps the infection at a very low level. Probably these patients have a predisposition to latent virus reactivation events. There, there will be either completely absence of um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, this means that the infection comes in but completely get removed, or there will be very weak SARS-CoV-2 infection. And there is a possibility of persistency also with low or no humoral immune response. There might be tissue specific reactivation events of latent herpes viruses, which is again interdependent on each other. The weak virus infection can reactivate the virus and the reactivated virus can help the uh, SARS-CoV-2 to go into persistency. There will be weak or very specific cytokine response in these patients and there will be tissue specific damage causing immune dysfunction, dysfunction of autonomic nervous system, which will have long term effect causing autoimmune response, metabolic alterations that we see in chronic fatigue syndrome patients. So patients of the symptoms will be comparable to them. You must be wondering from where all these herpes virus or latent virus stories started. At the very beginning stages of the pandemic, roughly around March, April of 2020, many clinical case reports were published showing infection of different herpes viruses in patients with COVID-19. Clinicians were not aware of potential virus reactivation at that time, so they described all of these as virus infection or co-infection. We were a bit surprised to see such an event. We realized that it might be a cause of reactivation than a fresh infection, particularly in days of social distancing. This reminded me a very unique and unexpected scientific story of my life. So the story started when I joined the labs of Professor Thomas Rupi in 2009 who at that time was studying a bacterium called chlamydia for its role in cell death. This bacterium strongly inhibits cell death. So Thomas asked me if I can infect these cells with a virus which actually induces the cell death and then if I can see if still the chlamydia can prevent the cell death. This would be a natural stressor for chlamydia. By the way, chlamydia is a gram-negative obligate intracellular bacterium. Chlamydia infection is one of the most frequent bacterial infection in the human being. Chlamydia trachomatis infection is actually one of the most frequent sexually transmitted disease also. It has a biphasic life cycle in the form of elementary bodies and reticulate bodies. In the structured illumination microscopy over here on the right hand side, you can see these elementary bodies in pink color um, in a cell culture, in a human cell in culture. I had experiences with HHV6 before and I knew that it induces cell death. So we took some cells, infected them with chlamydia and then threw some HHV6 viral particles into the culture. Next day we were all thrilled 
to see the effects, but we were super disappointed as there were hardly any chlamydia growing in it. Rather, there were huge persistent non-infectious inclusion bodies were there in these cells. You might be thinking that HHV6 stopped bacterial growth, so it's all good, but not exactly. These persistent bacteria are not dead completely and they cannot be treated with antibiotics. At any moment of time, when the physiological conditions um, allow them, they can come back or revert back to the normal infectious form of the chlamydia. Now, on the other hand, when we took cells carrying latent HHV6 genome, for example, the virus that is integrated within our chromosome, and infected these cells with chlamydia, we saw suppressed chlamydial growth, but reactivation of the dormant virus. Now we know that this happens when one of the bacterial protein or one of the chlamydial protein changes the structure of our telomere. It allows the latent virus from our telomere to come out and starts growing. Now, if you are thinking that it is way too complex and how two pathogens can really cross talk with each other, you are not alone. We were criticized badly 10 years back by the reviewers. But then now, after almost 10 years of work, we can explain you many of these phenomena. So it all revolves around mitochondria. Chlamydia is basically an ATP parasite. Chlamydia infection protects the host mitochondrial architecture by allowing mitochondrial fusion. Here in these cells, you can see a different mitochondrial morphology in cells having chlamydial infection. You can see those pink elementary bodies in these infected cells with very long networking mitochondria inside. Chlamydia needs a lot of metabolite and ATP from the cell, so it needs mitochondria to do that job. But on the other hand, HHV6 is a slow growing virus. It needs to protect itself from the host cell innate immune response to survive inside the cell. And hence, it doesn't like fused and good mitochondria. So it has its own machinery to fragment the mitochondria. If virus wins, and the mitochondria is fragmented, chlamydia cannot grow, so it hides. When bacteria wins or grows inside the cell, unintentionally, it allows the dormant virus to become active. Most people think that if a latent virus reactivates, it produces new virus particles and infects new cells and spreads throughout the body. That's absolutely not true. When a latent HHV6 reactivates, there are in fact many possibilities. The first possibility is that the host innate immune response wins and the reactivated virus is not allowed to grow anymore. There is no transcription, no expression of viral proteins and everything subsides. The second possibility, as I said, there is full-blown viral reactivation, there are formation of viral particles which infects new cells and the infection goes on. The other possibility is a leaky infection where there will be a production of some isolated viral gene expression which in fact um, can um, form antigen and allow the host immune response to develop. Sometimes it can also um, allow autoimmunity to develop by molecular mimicry. It can help uh, in immune evasion. It can also transactivate some of the cellular genes. Sometimes the reactivation of the virus can cause chromosomal instability also. And as the HHP6 particularly is in the telomere of the chromosome, it can actually cause premature chromosomal senescence also. It can also, um, if the virus comes out of the chromosome, it can also cause uh, telomeric truncation also. And in extreme case, it can also activate proto-oncogenes and can cause contribute to cancer development. So herpes viruses are some of the most underestimated viruses because they are very common. 
and as they are common, we think that they are harmless. But the fact is different. These dormant or latent herpes viruses often reactivate under various physiological conditions and they affect host cell in various ways. Now, if we look into the prevalence of the herpes viruses in general population, we, we can see that, for example, um, the herpes virus type 1, HSP1, is almost 66.6% .6 in general population. HSP2 is a little bit lower, around 13.2%. The varicella zoster virus was very high before 1995, but after the uh, vaccination started, uh, its prevalence has gone down. The cytomegalovirus uh, prevalence is up to 80%. EBV, which is a tumorigenic virus, herpes virus, is there in, in up to 90% of the uh, uh, population. The Kaposi sarcoma virus is also ranging from 10 to 90% in different geographical regions. The HHV 6A, 6B and 7 highlighted here in yellow are very unique viruses because they can also be inherited. You can get the virus genetically inherited from your parents also and uh, prevalence of these viruses are also extremely high from 85 to 90 percent in the general population. So we think that these uh, herpes viruses which are so prevalent in general population must be contributing from time to time to our own um, cellular physiology. So we came up with a pilot experiment uh, based on our initial hypothesis that it might be possible that the SARS-CoV-2 is somehow reactivating these latent herpes viruses. And this is what we also wanted to validate for the study of uh, MECFS. Then during this time people started realizing um, delayed appearance of MECFS-like symptoms in post-COVID patients, long COVID patients. So we went ahead and infected cells carrying latent herpes viruses, particularly HHV6, because this is our most favorite virus, let's say. And then we wanted to see if the SARS-CoV-2 infection is doing something to the HHV6 reactivation. So what you see here in, this, in your screen are um, U2A cells. These are bone osteosarcoma cells. Um, and, uh, these cells reactivate HHV6 quite nicely in um, culture, so we use these cells for our studies. So these cells are genetically altered to carry a reporter latent herpes virus 6 viral genome, which actually produces the green protein, the GFP protein, only when the virus is reactivated. So here are two representative images of these cells infected with SARS-CoV-2. These cells have very low ACE2 receptors, so they do not get infected heavily until we put the ACE2 protein in the cells. That's good for us because that allows a buffering time for the interaction between the virus and the host cell, like it normally happens within our body. Here are the virus um, spike proteins so that you can um, see that the cells that are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 you can compare the virus growth to this beautiful image um, from Goldspit et al. paper published in Lancet in 2020. SARS-CoV-2 grow within membrane-bound vesicles like I showed you for chlamydia. You can compare um, with the bacterial um, structure. Now you can see that there is a reactivation of HHV6 in some of these cells which are green in color. The interesting fact here is that the cells which are reactivated mostly do not carry SARS-CoV-2 infection. You cannot see spike proteins inside these cells. It seems that some of them do have small vesicles, like the infection started in these cells, but without much of virus spike proteins. We are working at single cell level to understand why virus reactivating cells do not allow SARS-CoV-2 to grow. Is it persistency? that we are predicting or we are talking about which actually um, inhibits the virus growth inside the cell. Future will answer those questions, but for the time being, it seems that there is a crosstalk between SARS-CoV-2 and HHV-6. The SARS-CoV-2 infection reactivates HHV-6, which is possibly helps in suppressing even the SARS-CoV-2 infection. We do not believe that latent herpes virus reactivation is widespread and um, it can be detected everywhere, including blood and serum. This is not the case. 
For example, in MECF patients, we found very strong HHV6 reactivation in uh, cranial nerve ganglia. Uh, in these images, you can see um, the viral microRNA being expressed in these, um, in these nerves, um, which potentially explains the autonomic nervous system dysfunction in these patients, explaining um, the um, uh, clinical effects on heart, uh, lungs, kidney, digestive system, or even construction of blood vessels, um, etc. So now the big question that we are discussing today is whether long COVID patients are similar to MECFS patients or not. Frankly speaking, we have preliminary data that suggests that the first stages of long COVID is not exactly comparable to MECFS. But possibly if the symptoms and clinical conditions persist for a long time, the long COVID patients might develop into MECFS. So what is common between long COVID and MECFS? We are here able to show that herpes virus reactivation is a common thread or signature between MECFS and long COVID. We are able to see that many of the MECFS patients and the small number of long COVID patients that we have managed to test so far have antibodies against many of the herpes virus DUT pages. DUT pages Proteins are highly conserved among herpes viruses and are expressed during early stages of virus reactivation. These are the proteins which are necessary to prevent the DUTP to be incorporated into uh, DNA molecules. Normally UTP should be there in the RNA molecules, but when the DUTP is incorporated into the DNA molecules, it can induce innate immune response. So these proteins are there. Um, um, very conserved uh, during the process of evolution and uh, which actually prevents the DUTP to enter into the uh, DNA molecule. Now healthy controls also have these antibodies but not against multiple herpes viruses particularly not against the EVV DUT pages. Here is the heat map that you can see where the pattern in the first 25 MECFS patients from the top is comparable to the five long COVID patients that we have tested so far at the bottom. But these patterns are not comparable to the 20 healthy controls which are there in the middle. Because of the presence of antibodies against multiple different herpes viruses including EBV, HHV6, HSV12, etc. We believe that the presence of antibodies against these proteins also mean that not only the antibody is there, there are these herpes virus proteins also somewhere in the body, or maybe also in the serum. We can also show that uh, these individual herpes virus proteins or DUT pages are alone, they are not very effective in um, inducing mitochondrial fragmentation, but together with other herpes virus DUT pages, um, that means when multiple different herpes virus DUT pages combine, like EBV with uh, HSP6 DUT base or EBV HSP6 and HSP1 DUT base in a single cell, they are very effective in altering mitochondrial architecture and possibly its metabolism, the metabolism of the host cell, and also can induce uh, host cell uh, senescence in a long um, in a long run. So, where are the differences then? Recently, we looked into 240 different antibodies in human serum using a very high throughput approach. The serum antibody profiles of MECFS patients suggest high degree of overlap between um, inflammatory rheumatoid disease, autoimmune diseases like um, SLE, Hashimoto thyroiditis, celiac disease, um, neurodegenerative diseases like multiple sclerosis and MECFS. Um, we found some of the um, antibodies against some of the um, um, uh, components like antibody IgG against the single strand DNA is very high in MECFS patients, uh, statistically significant enough, which is not the case in long COVID patients. For example, the IgM uh, response against the myelin basic protein is very high in MECFS patients in comparison to the healthy controls, which is not the case in the long COVID patients. So tests in long COVID patients doesn't point towards the same as we see in MECFS patients. So autoimmunity might be a consequence of pathological changes in MECFS, which is too early to see in long COVID patients. To test our working model about long COVID that I just explained, 
we are undertaking several projects. Um, uh, for example, um, we are looking into uh, the proteomics of the serum that uh, we find in MECFS patients and long COVID patients and how these proteomics uh, differ or overlap between these two conditions. We are uh, looking into a single cell at a um, RNA dynamics label called uh, SLAMSEC using a technique called SLAMSEC uh, to understand individual blood cell transcriptomics in long COVID and MECFS patients. We are also searching for novel antibodies which um, uh, may not be um, studied or we cannot uh, study in using uh, large scale uh, high throughput approaches. So we, if we can find uh, such antibodies against infectious uh, molecules or uh, non-infectious molecules in the serum of long COVID or MECFS patients. We are also looking into a, uh, a very core component of innate immunity called uh, RNA, it's called RNAs L, whether it has some role to play in innate immune dysfunction in long COVID and MECFS patients. So all these uh, projects are uh, uh, funded um, um, or some of them are even not funded. So we are constantly looking for financial support. Um, it would be um, exciting um, if we can also look into various other aspects of uh, these two conditions, long COVID and MECFS, but there is always uh, financial constraints which, uh, which keeps us um, uh, focused on um, some of the very core uh, aspects of our work. So um, I would like to uh, thank our collaborative partners and funders um, uh, within Germany and outside Germany Without uh, their help, um, this project or our work is absolutely impossible. We are also looking forward for new clinical partners in other European and non-European countries so that we can expand our work to um, patient cohorts outside of Germany. And we are supported by some unusual uh, small large uh, foundations and also the MECFS patient community who constantly provides uh, some financial support uh, to keep us going uh, in our quest to solve this disease. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and um, I would really love to take questions and discuss the, the subject uh, maybe in more detail with you. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Dr. Christie, um, and apologies to those who had issues with audio. The recording will be made available after today's webinar, so hopefully you'll, you'll be able to catch up by, by watching it after the fact. Um, if you do have a question for Dr. Proustie, you can submit it via the chat function, the Q&A function, um, and we will read it out. We've already had a few come in. Um, so the first from Ben Dixon, do you think a long COVID diagnostic test will be developed in isolation from a test for MECFS? Yeah, uh, first of all, um, I'm really sorry that uh, the sound system had uh, issues. Uh, I don't know exactly where the problem is, but you can get the video later on and um, you can uh, watch the uh, presentation um, whenever you have retirement. So to answer the question, yes. So as I mentioned that um, I don't believe that um, long COVID is one single type of disease, yeah? So if we, um, as we say that, um, um, probably that there are two different types, maybe there are multiple different um, subgroups or something like that, but I, I, I generally believe that um, there is one type which is closely comparable to MECFS, which is a limited number of patients, um, but there are a large number of uh, long COVID patients, which is probably not comparable to MECFS patients. They, uh, they, they have completely different spectrum. The clinical conditions may overlap. So when we talk about uh, diagnostics, it is probably extremely difficult to fit everyone into one diagnostic platform, yeah? Um, even if you look into cytokines, there, there are many labs who are looking into cytokines. So there is so much of overlap um, between different diseases and different conditions that I don't think that a single diagnostic will fulfill everyone, yeah? So maybe um, depending on, like, like, like 
I said, um, if I would like to um, study long COVID patients, I see that there is a group of long COVID patients uh, who have these uh, herpes virus DUT pages, particularly the EVB DUT pages expressed uh, antibody against these EVB DUT pages are there. So they are clearly a group of patients which also overlaps with MECFS. So for me, this is one type of diagnostic. I can say that, okay, these patients may be closely related to MECFS. But on the other hand, um, I mean, I have not checked um, uh, large cohort sub, uh, samples. I would love to do that, but um, we will see how things will, um, uh, uh, the results are comparable between those who, who have the uh, symptoms like MECFS or the others, okay? This is too early to tell that, but in my personal opinion, I don't think that there is, there will be any one diagnostic which will fit to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree. And we're seeing that in the registry that people are having long-term effects for a period of time and then they recover. Some people are going on to develop more MECFS type symptoms. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves over time. Um, we have two questions from Ed Hornick. So the first being um, based on the doctor's working theory of long COVID, could uh, long COVID two paths, could path two non-hospitalized explain why many COVID-19 patients test negative, but still have all the symptoms? So we'll yes, talk about that first, maybe. Yeah, so that, that, that's what I, I said, like um, the experimental data, the, the, in, um, the in cell culture experimental data suggests that some patients have the tendency to suppress the long COVID, um, um, the growth of the SARS-CoV-2 in the cells. We, we believe that this one way to explain is that maybe that there is something like herpes virus reactivation going on or any other virus reactivation going on. And because of the physiological changes inside the cells, the SARS-CoV-2 cannot grow and goes into persistency. And this happens at the very early stages when a couple of viral particles enter into your, into your body and they get suppressed. So there, there is no uh, immune response against these viruses. So you probably won't get uh, them positive uh, tested um, also in the later on. Until unless they have really um, uh, grown up, they killed um, certain cells, they grew inside some cells, they broke apart the cells and then the viral uh, components are released against which uh, the immune response inside the body develops, yeah? So it's possible, yeah. And uh, the second question, um, it appears that Epstein-Barr virus has something to do with long COVID. Um, are, is anyone looking at that? Or are you looking at that? Yeah, so we, we have clear evidence that Epstein-Barr virus has uh, something to do. So you might um, realize that there are a couple of papers already out showing that um, long COVID patients have high, high rate of reactivation of EBV. What we are also missing here is that um, there might be um, um, leaky EBV reactivations, which probably cannot be diagnosed by the classical diagnostic tools available in the clinics. So I guess the, uh, the numbers that we see that people have the EBV reactivation or other herpes virus reactivation are even probably higher than what we see. So yes, uh, we are looking into that. Um, uh, I guess the knowledge is um, spreading, so more and more um, uh, researchers uh, will be interested and will look into this. And hopefully, um, more um, papers will come out soon. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. So, we have a question from Sibyl Danerdorf. Danerdorf, I'm going to apologize in advance for mispronouncing your name. Um, who would like to know what you think about the recent cure of four long COVID patients with BC007? Do you uh, know about that? Do you, could you have any thoughts on that? I see, Bella. Um, so she's from Germany, I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, this is a very um, sensitive and um, complicated questions to, um, question to answer. Um, so these uh, BC007 uh, is um, basically uh, works against the uh, antibodies against the uh, muscarinic receptors, and uh, yes, um, we also find um, antibody against muscarinic receptor is high in long COVID patients, also in MECFS patients, some of the MECFS patients, which is being published by many labs, including Carmen. Um, but I, I, I personally, it's my personal scientific opinion that um, the antibody alone is not the key to the disease. Yeah, we believe that it might be in 
combination with other factors can contribute, but not alone itself. So it means that um, just by treating uh, this antibody probably will not uh, be beneficial from all uh, long COVID patients. Um, definitely, uh, a large number of long COVID patients uh, probably will be benefited because if the muscarinic is... So I believe that those who have the uh, strong SARS-CoV-2 infection in the beginning and then developing the post-COVID um, uh, clinical conditions, they might be in a better chance of getting benefited from this uh, BCG-7, but uh, not uh, from the, um, the second type of long COVID patients that I described. But I would... I, I might... I might be proven wrong. So I don't want to uh, uh, discourage anyone, but mm -hmm. I am also closely following and I'm looking forward to, um, I'm hoping that um, um, things uh, work and uh, yeah, people get benefited, yeah. Thank you for that. So um, next question from Vinda Kanai, and again, apologies for my mispronunciation. Um, does a CMV feature at all in your work? And do you, do you ever look at that as part of your research? Yes, we are actually um, trying to cover all herpes viruses. So basically um, nine uh, different herpes viruses. We're slowly expanding. Um, we are collaborating uh, with other um, uh, collaborators. Uh, we started collaborating with Ohio uh, University in USA. They are really um, the pioneers in um, the field of uh, DUT pages, herpes virus DUT pages. They previously published with uh, together with Nancy. Clemas that um, MECFS patients, Gulf War syndrome patients, they have these uh, uh, antibodies. So we are collaborating with them and we are uh, slowly expanding. It takes a lot of time to um, produce these recombinant proteins, purify them, and then uh, test uh, the serum to have antibodies against these due to based proteins. So slowly we are expanding. Yeah, we have now three, four, uh, but hopefully within the next couple of months, we will have more and more. Yeah, we are covering all herpes viruses, basically trying to cover, yeah. So there's a couple of questions that have come through specific to HHV6. So the first one, Borrelia and Babesia um, also cause long-term symptoms similar to MECFS. Do you think HHV6 is potentially implicated in these other illnesses? So let's not talk about HHV6 alone. HHV6 is something which is our model organism. So we work with it. So I talk about it. It doesn't mean that mm -hmm. I feel HHV6 is doing everything. That's not the case. So what I'm trying to explain here is that there can be a, um, a condition where two different pathogens within the same cell can affect each other. They can like each other, they can fight with each other, they can uh, compete with each other. So when this type of conditions happen, so particularly th imagine like this, when one pathogen, whether it's a virus or bacteria, when one pathogen is fast growing and requires a lot of metabolites from the cell within a couple of hours, couple of days, then they try, to, they try to hijack the whole entire cell. But on the same time, if there are slow growing viruses, like particularly the HHV6, HHV7, and things like that, they are slow growing viruses. Their first job is to protect themselves against the host. Yeah. So they try to follow a completely different path. And when these two paths overlap with each other, so there comes the problem. So as using an experimental model system, we saw that if chlamydia and HHV6 can affect each other, why not? SARS-CoV-2 and HHV6 or EVV can also do the same thing. So it's the same with Borrelia or any other pathogen also. So I am not talking about HHV6 alone. It's just an example. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, a question from Charles D'Souza. Has there been any development on a COVID-19 induced ERV pathology? Um, I, I am not sure if I get the question properly. Um, can you repeat it again, Sarah? Yeah, has there, and I'm not sure I do, has there been any development on COVID-19 induced ERV pathology? And Charles, if you're still on, perhaps you could rephrase that question. We'll go on to the next one. We're not, we're not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, okay, the next question from Martin Niedermuller. How often do you see the phenomenon in MECFS that people have neither antibodies to HSV1 plus 2 CMV and EBV at the same time? Yeah, so clearly there is a, not a large subset, but there is a small subset. At this moment, I can say roughly around 25% of MECFS patients, they have um, they do not have antibody against EVB. Sometimes they have these uh, uh, 
antibody against the HHV6 DUTPase against HSP1, HSP2 DUTPase. So far, we have uh, managed to test only three, four. So, but they don't have EVB. But 70%, up to 70% of MECFS patients have antibodies against the EVB virus, uh, EVP, the Epstein Barr virus DUTPase. So, yes, there is a small number of patients. So, think about it. Maybe it is just a matter of um, um, sensitivity. Um, maybe there is uh, this 30% one I'm talking about is not enough, yeah, which we cannot detect basically. So it's a matter of sensitivity. But if you look into one or two previous paper, which is not done in a large number of patients, they say that there is a small number of even um, healthy controls who also saw um, um, antibody against EBV. So my argument here is that, um, for example, if you get EVV infection, right, uh, the, the mononucleosis, you might develop this antibody against EVV, but it might be possible that you do not have antibody against the other herpes virus at this at that moment. Yeah. So our experiment and results show that one herpes virus DUT base may not be enough to cause effect or have any harmful effect on mitochondria. You need to have two, three, or others. So at biochemical levels. We do not know whether these uh, different herpes virus DUTPase might form a complex which is more effective in causing mitochondrial fragmentation, or it is just the dose effect. We do not know that at this moment. Yeah, so we believe that you need more, which is clearly a tendency in MECFS patients and long COVID patients. Thank you for that. And then, unfortunately, this is going to be the last question that we have time to answer, but we will try and answer. Um, you know, we've we've still got probably about 15 questions that we haven't got to, uh, Fupesh. So you've, you've been a hit. There's a lot of interest and fascination, um, but we will try and answer these questions and get back to people via email. But uh, perhaps we'll take this as the last question, which is an interesting one, although I think it's gonna be uh, more one that you hypothesize around versus one that you have evidence for. But the question from Daniel Loy is, if SARS-CoV-2 is capable of persistence, could this increase the likelihood of post-viral disease in future infections from other pathogens? Yes, Daniel, rightly taken. And, and I fully agree. If it is proven beyond doubt that SARS-CoV-2 is able to go into persistency, it is quite possible that various, under various conditions, various physiological conditions, not only infection, we have seen that uh, persistency of bacteria and viruses can be uh, reverted back under uh, use of many different drugs also. So it is fair chance, fair possibility that under suppressed immunological conditions um, or on any other uh, physiological conditions, these viruses can reactivate and can uh, cause uh, problems which is, uh, that's why I, I believe that uh, the real impact of long COVID or this pandemic we have not seen yet. We have seen a lot of lives uh, lost and um, uh, it's a huge issue, but the big issue probably will be seen in uh, coming five to 10 years when we realize that we have missed actually a large uh, part of the uh, population which basically um, are going to uh, suffer in the long term. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that's why I applaud efforts like yours um, to really start to look at this early, right? And something that we're also trying to do with the registry, the more we can get information and start to understand what's going on in these early days, the more helpful I think it will become. And hopefully we can avoid some of the um, potential downstream effects um, as we move forward. So thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for, for taking the Q&A. Uh, it was a wonderful discussion and we will be sharing a recording of the session on our social channels on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram within the next 24 hours. So hopefully you guys can um, take a look at that if you have the sections that you, you missed. Um, and um, we will be sharing in the chat a registration for our next long COVID webinar. It's going to be coming up on October 19th, uh, featuring Dr. Carmen Scheibenbogen from University Hospital Charité and Dr. Jill Jaycox from Yale. So hopefully you can tune into that one. Um, and one last plug for the registry, uh, please consider signing up at umeregistry.com. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Proustie. And I look forward to seeing you again in October. Thank you. And uh, have a nice evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.